All right, folks, welcome to week two of this uh, wild spring quarter. Um, we'll go ahead and get started here. We've got the recording going. Uh, hopefully everybody was able to find the links to the recordings. Um, uh, if you, well, if you're looking for the recordings because you can't make it to lecture, this might not be all that helpful. Um, but we can go through and show you where the um, links are. So I'm, it's going to be stay organized just based on um, what week the lecture was in. So if you click on week one, you'll see the links to YouTube. Um, however, if you were not here and also not able to find these links, then this is not all that helpful. Um, so it's, it's the uh, it's my equivalent of if you're not here, raise your hand. Um, if you're not here and you need help finding the YouTube recordings, please let me know. Um, anyway, uh, they will all be uploaded to YouTube on my, my YouTube account. Um, so you can also just go there or just find the links for whatever you're looking for um, from the course website. Uh, so let's start talking a little bit about some questions you guys raised on the quiz and on the discussion board um, about chemistry in general and about this class and some random questions about me too. Um, so I kind of most of them fell fall into a few rent a few common categories. So if I didn't answer yours specifically, it's because I thought it was close enough for one of these others. But feel free to ask uh, again if I don't, did not respond to yours. Um, why did I choose chemistry over any other major? Because um, I could do it. I could do chemistry when I was in high school. My chemistry teacher was really really good, and it seemed like everybody else was. Um, either intimidated by chemistry or struggled with it more than I thought I was. Um, so it was still a lot of work, but I thought, hey, if other people have trouble with this, then that means there's not gonna be very many people that can do what I do, um, which is sounds like a dumb reason to pick a major, um, but I, I really liked all my different subjects in high school and this, that was just a good way to narrow it down to something I could major in. Um, although I wound up taking classes all over the place too, lots of liter literature and, and creative writing classes and lots of math and Spanish classes too. Um, do you think there are other planets out there that are similar to Earth? Um, that's a really good question. It's also, there's a um, really famous Nobel Prize winning physicist named Enrico Fermi, um, who uh, first first came up with, uh, did the math in his head and came up with the idea that there should be billions of other planets out there that are similar to Earth. So um, where is everybody, basically, was the way he phrased it. Um, he actually introduced or uh, interrupted a bunch of his colleagues at lunch in the cafeteria at the Manhattan Project. Uh, he was, so he was working with, um, with people like Oppenheimer and uh, and Richard Feynman and stuff like that. And he was just eating lunch and they were having a discussion. And he just yelled out, where is everybody um, in the middle of their lunch and then went on to explain what he was thinking about. So statistically speaking, it makes sense that there should be lots of other planets out there that are similar to earth, even with intelligent life, but odds are that we'll never actually um, contact any of those just because space is so big, things are so far apart. Even traveling at the speed of light, it would take something like 10,000 years to get across from one end of the Milky Way to the other. And that's not even considering the fact that we have other galaxies out there that are way further away than that. Um, what's the weirdest thing your kid has done? This is an interesting question. I had to think about this a little bit. Um, my wife and I keep a running tally of, well, I never thought that that phrase would make sense. Um, you know, that includes things like stop driving, stop driving that car on your sister's face. Um, no, you can't put mayonnaise on your cookies, things like that. Um, so it's, it's really just a, a running, running tally. It's not a single weirdest thing. It just slowly feels like I'm moving further and further away from normal reality. Um, the longer I spend with, uh, with my kids in, in quarantine. Um, and who knows, maybe we are moving further, further away from normal reality. 
Um, how long have I been teaching? I've been teaching since 2012. Um, I taught at Sierra Nevada College on the north side of the lake for a couple of years part time, and I taught here for uh, a couple of years part time before I was full time here. Um, and then I taught in grad school as well at University of Colorado in Boulder. Um, so I taught engineering students how to do chemistry there and taught some upper division um, mm -hmm. lectures. So I've been haven't been everywhere, but I've been at some big schools and I've been at some four year schools and I like I like community college better. Um, how do I manage my time? And while well, getting everything done and making everyone happy? Well, that's a that's a real trick there. That's just everybody's life, right? My wife is in the same room working on her stuff right now, and she just started laughing when I said that question out loud because I don't have the answer to that. Um, you get really used to being tired as a parent um, because there's always more stuff that needs to be done than time there to do it in. Um, that and you uh, you teach your, your kids to enjoy doing the same things that you enjoy doing so that you are both like doing something you want to do and need to do at the same time as your kids are having fun. So, you know, teach your kids to cook with you and then you can cook dinner and your kids are happy playing with you, playing with you as well, um, or watching and playing baseball, that kind of thing. Um, a lot of you, uh, this is the first time I've ever had more than one person ask me this question. I've seen this question before, but not quite, not very many times. If I had to pick again, would I still pick chemistry as a major? Um, well, it would be interesting to go a different path. I think aerospace engineering would be really, really fun. Um, but on the other hand, I really like chemistry too. So I might have spent less time in grad school and focused more on teaching to begin with and less time on research. Um, but uh, other than that, I probably would be about where I am now, just maybe a year or two earlier. Um, as far as random chemistry stuff, somebody asked me what chemical engineering was all about. And so chemical engineering and engineering in general, is going to be the process of taking science and turning it into something useful or something you can make money with. Um, so chemical engineering is taking chemistry and basically doing scale up processes. So if we know we can make a certain pharmaceutical in a lab and we can make five grams of it at a time, how do we scale that up so that we could make, um, you know, 500 grams at a time or 500 kilograms at a time? Um, and that that winds up being a non-trivial issue, meaning it takes a lot of work. Scaling up is not as easy as just doubling the recipe. Um, so chemical engineering can be in you know fuel production, pharmaceuticals, biotech. Um, and it, it has a lot to do with basically optimizing processes, taking something that's been shown to work in a lab and either making it more efficient with better yields, making it work at higher, um, larger amounts. Um, someone asked me about microdosing and using psychedelics as uh, therapy. There is some interesting research out there um, on some of this stuff, but the problem is, is that most psychedelics have been on have been classified as Schedule One um, drugs since the '60s. And a Schedule One drug means that you can't even get permission to do research at a research in institution with these substances. And so it's basically put a block on any research using psychedelics in the United States for the last 50 years. Um, so there's been some interesting research happening in Europe and sort of some of these things are sort of being lifted a little bit, um, but it's, it's definitely interesting. I think in the next decade or so, there's gonna be some really interesting, um, you know, sort of paradigm shifts within, within um, psychiatry when it comes to treating mental illness and other disorders. There's some interesting research on treating depression with, with psilocybin mushrooms. Um, there's been some interesting research on treating PTSD um, using ecstasy, MDMA, um, because it's what's called an empathogen, meaning it's a drug that generates feelings of empathy for people around you. And there, the research is su suggesting that PTSD, um, one of the symptoms is that you lose start to lose empathy for the people around you um and so there you know there's some really interesting things happening and we'll see what happens in the in the near future um it's definitely neurology in general and the in, interaction of drugs and the brain function is really a field that's blowing up right now 
Um, as far as nanotechnology, there's absolutely a lot of nanotechnology that, that uh, comes into play. Nanotechnology is basically the, our ability to make things at the atomic scale. So either to design our pharmaceuticals atomic scale or de design, de um, design substances or scaffolds that cells can grow on. So tissue engineering has a lot of um, applications in, or nanotechnology has a lot of applications in tissue engineering. Um, drug delivery, there's been some research on using um, buckyballs, which are look basically look like a, a soccer ball um, made out of carbon atoms. Um, and then in theory, you could put a single molecule inside this buckyball and it wouldn't get released until a certain point in the body. So you could deliver a certain drug to a very specific part of the body and not have as many side effects. So for things like chemotherapy, um, and uh, various applications like that. So there's a lot of places where, where material science and nanotechnology is interacting with um, biology and, and modern medicine, which is a really cool field as well. All right, what's the most fun experiment I've done in my chemistry career? Um, this is gonna sound like a cop-out, but probably brewing beer. Um, brewing beer is a very, very chemical process. Um, and so the chemical engineer in me really had a, a lot of fun when I was brewing beer a lot, um, optimizing the process. How can I spend as little time possible making the best beer possible? Um, and that, so you have to, you know, you have to have healthy yeast cells. You have got to get good fresh hops and then you have to isomerize the hops just right. And in order to get the flavor profiles you want. And that was a really, that's a really fun uh, application and you wind up making five gallons of beer at a time. So it also gives you some of the practical um, product at the end. So probably probably doing that. Although I also did design a lab that we've done in upper division um, OCAM before where we started from cornmeal and were able to extract corn oil and then ferment the starch that was left over to make ethanol and corn oil, which then you can react together to make biodiesel. Um, so starting from corn and going all the way to biodiesel is kind of a fun project too. We didn't have great yields, but I've only tried it once. I need to optimize some more things in there. Um, favorite area of chemistry, that's pretty similar, right? I like biochemistry a lot, but to understand biochemistry, you've got to understand organic chemistry. And to understand organic chemistry, you need to understand the quantum. And to understand the quantum, you need to take some upper division math classes and so on down the line. Um, so I really like a lot of areas of chemistry, but mostly because they all wind up impacting biochemistry and, you know, neurology, how the brain works, how your body processes nutrition, things like that. Last but not least on the random chemistry questions, how do you turn lead into gold? Um, turns out we can do that now. You just need a, you know, a per particle accelerator um, and a whole bunch of electricity and some, and some specific isotopes. Um, but if you take certain atoms and you smash them together really, really, really fast, um, you can get them to fuse, to go through a fusion reaction and turn, you can actually turn lead into gold that way. Um, the problem is, is it's pretty much always going to cost more than the value of the gold that you get out. Um, so we can do it, we can, but at the same time, it's never going to actually be useful until we get to the point where we've used up, you know, where it's, um, not feasible to just recycle the gold that already exists in old computers and cell phones and stuff like that. Um, but you can do it with enough energy and electricity and uh, money. You can you can do pretty much anything these days. Um, a lot of you are worried about the math for this class. Hopefully the math review last week may have calmed some of that down, but it also may have made you nervous as well. Um, that's normal. Um, math, the math required for this class though is just gonna be algebra and, and basic arithmetic. We're just going to practice using it in very specific ways. So don't worry if you haven't had calculus, I might reference calculus here or there because there's a couple places where calculus plays a role. Um, but you won't need to do any calculus. You won't need to do anything beyond basic algebra. Um, when you take gen chem series, we'll get into writing our own algebra expressions, which takes practice, but then it's still basically just using the algebra you already know. 
right? So don't be too worried about that. If you are able to follow along with the math review, even if you had to get some help here and there, then you should be fine as far as the level of math for this class. Um, a lot of questions about how can I, how can I do well in this class? Um, will this be an easy quarter for us? I actually like that one. That's an, an interesting way of phrasing it. And as, uh, as usual, if you ask me a point blank question, the answer is going to be yes and no. Um, it'll be easy in the sense that if you do everything I expect you to, if you do all the assignments, get them turned in on time and, you know, and ask questions when you're confused, you should be able to get a B or an A in this class without being too worried about it at any point. Um, that said, doing all those assignments and showing up and asking the questions and doing the studying you need to do is a lot of work. So it's gonna be a lot of work, but it's nothing that you should be worried about, man, I don't know if I can do this. It's gonna be more about budgeting time and making sure you, you get your um, all of your, your assignments done on time. Um, and that applies to the second one too, as long as you can stay motivated and I'll do my best to keep you motivated too, everybody should be able to get an A or B in this class. That's always my goal, be able to give only A's and B's at the end of the quarter. So keep yourself motivated and you shouldn't worry about it too much. Um, this last question, what's the best way to study and prepare for the test? Well, with the practice test, of course. Um, the practice test, I'll give you about a week before the final and it's, it's gonna be last year's final exam. So you'll know exactly what the structure of the test is going to look like. There'll be no surprises as far as the type of questions that I'm going to ask. Um, so you really should be able to, okay, these are the areas that I need to focus on. These are the areas where I'm, where I'm really comfortable. Um, I need to make sure I'm not spending too much time on this question. You can do a lot of that planning, and we'll talk about some test-taking strategies when we get closer. Um, but I'll absolutely give you the practice test, and that should be able to help you figure out how to, to spend your time and energy when we get closer. Um, are all the labs gonna be through the online lab sims? Uh, no, not all of them, probably a, probably more than half of them, but this week in particular is one that um, where you guys are gonna be doing a different version of a virtual lab. They'll all be online in some capacity, um, but they won't all be through Labster just because there are some things Labster doesn't do well. Labster doesn't ask enough math questions if you ask me as far as giving you, you know, having you guys write down numbers and actually do calculations. So we'll supplement in other places. So for this first or second lab, you'll be working on um, how to take measurements properly, um, similar to what we were talking about last week and, and practice doing some arithmetic with them, um, but it won't be through Labster. And again, if you have trouble getting Labster to run properly, um, let me know. I can help you troubleshoot, or we can find an alternative assignment that you can do um, on a on a week to week basis. Um, but uh, we'll do we'll do the best we can with that. And there are going to be some that are fun and cool, and I, I think there are some that Labster actually does better than what we could do in actual lab. Um, and there are some places where it just doesn't do as well. So, um, but. So just be paying attention to the instructions in the in the actual uh, lab assignments, and you should be okay. Uh, last but not least, nobody asked about this, but I didn't um, did not mention tutoring um, in last week. So we do have a chemistry tutor through LTCC through Cranium Cafe, which if you uh, so let me go to the LTCC website. Um, from the LTCC website, if you go to virtual campus um, and scroll down to the library section, which is not where I where it uh, used to be, let's, under, let's find it together. There you go. So under student support, you scroll down, get to library. There's a link for tutoring. You click on tutoring. It might make you log in again. But it's the same login as your as your uh, passport. And then once it goes, it doesn't usually take that long. It 
does frequently give me trouble like this, but not usually this many times in a row. Um, but there's going to be a list of people and it might be giving me trouble because I'm not a student. Um, yeah, that's not what we want. Anyway, so if you do this, you should get a list of, and it, it works for you. Um, you, should, you get a list of tutors and what their hours are. And there's a bunch of math tutors, writing tutors, and there's a chemistry tutor um, whose name is Erina McCarthy. Um, and I don't know what her hours are scheduled to be this quarter. If you work at Barton, I know several of you work at Barton. Um, Erina works at Barton as well, um, somewhere in the hospital. I'm not sure exactly where. Um, but so you may, have, may even know her from other places around town. Um, she's great and will... Um, and once everybody's schedule settles down, she'll have a regular schedule that'll be, she'll be available for a couple hours a week as well. So if I'm not around, or if you want to talk to somebody that's not me, um, go see Erina or, and uh, start study groups. Or I noticed a couple of you guys on the discussion boards that we're working on um, setting up some study groups. That's a great idea. Um, I highly recommend that even if they're on Zoom, uh, it's still a good idea to be able to bounce ideas off of people. All right. So. Um, Go to tutoring, come to my office hours, um, work together in groups. You guys make your own discussion discussion board posts too to either look for people or ask questions, et cetera. Um, and you should be good to go. So I think I got, I got to all the questions that were directly related to the course from the quiz and from the discussion board, I think. Um, does anybody have any questions that I haven't covered so far about how the course is gonna work? All right. So I'm trying to get better at waiting when I ask a question like that before I just move on. Um, Brian Urien, in the art, one of the art instructors here at LTCC has a rule that when he asks a question, he has to wait for 10 seconds um, of nobody responding before he moves on. And 10 seconds is a really long time um, when you're talking about uh, just silence. So I'll try to leave you enough time or at least, or I'll just go on a random tangent for a couple minutes after um, I ask a question like that to give you time to formulate your thoughts, ask a question. Um, but for now, let's move on. Um, so Anthony, hang out um, at uh, break and I'll show, I'll show you how to get to, it's, it's on passports where you would register. If you look at where you register, if you're in, it'll show you if you're section one or section two. And I'll, I'll show you again too at break. All right, so let's let's go back to where we were at the end of last week. We were talking about how we do math with numbers and how do we know where to round when we do our math. All right, so in, we, we did all these exact examples, um, but just to go back through them again, remember if we're adding or subtracting, we wanna be, we want to make sure we keep the same uncertainty as our least certain number. So remember, uncertainty is um, the last recorded digit in a measured number is going to be approximate. It could be off by one digit in that last place. That's our uncertainty. So we, in other words, another way of saying we want to keep the same uncertainty is we want to keep the same number of decimal places is another way of phrasing it. But that applies even if we're not behind the decimal point as well. So if we have something that goes to the hundredths place and something that, and adding to another number that also goes to the hundredths place, we're going to wind up keeping our answer to the hundredths place. And so, We're plugging in the correct answers here. This would give us 9.83 when we plug it into the calculator. And we that keeps our uncertainty in the same spot. So we don't need to do any rounding here. Um, if we are doing subtraction, addition and subtraction are really the same step in the order of operations, right? In PEMDAS. Um, so we keep we do the same rules for subtraction. We keep the same uncertainty. So 6.0 minus 0.08 
the calculator answer would be 5.92 gallons. But our uncertainty here, our starting amount of six gallons is plus or minus a tenth of a gallon. So we need to make sure we keep our uncertainty to the tenths place. All right, and so, and again, one of the trickier things is you can occasionally wind up with it looking like your number doesn't change. 12 minutes plus 0.19 minutes, the calculator answer would be 12.19 minutes, but that's, we need it to be plus or minus a minute which means it's just going to get rounded to 12 minutes. All right, so addition and subtraction, the rule makes sense, right? If any one of our measurements could be off by, say, a mile, then that means our final answer could be off by a mile. Addition and, sub and multiplication looks a little bit different because because if we're doing addition and multiplication our sometimes our numbers wind up being way off way larger or smaller than what we started with and so what that means is that we need a way a different way of estimating how precise a number is beyond just the uncertainty when we multiply and divide our uncertainties get multiplied as well and so we need to make sure that we are also um, going to make nowhere to round. And so the way we know where to round with multiplication and division is we keep the same number of significant figures. Right? Because remember, a number of significant figures was a good way of estimating how precise a measurement was. Because if it had four significant figures, that meant somebody went to the trouble of measuring all four of those numbers. If it's only two significant figures, then it's not as precise of a number. And so we use that number of sig figs as our measure for how, um, how accurate our number is here, instead of just looking at the direct uncertainty. So when we do any multiplication, so if we have, we do the math here, 12.1, times 3.4 times 187.4. The calculator answer winds up being 7709.636. Um, and that's that's going to be um, the just the number. If we look at the units, a lot of times, the, the easiest way to think about units when it comes to knowing what to do with them with this fraction versus um, multiplication division is you treat them like they're a variable. If we had 12x times 3x, we would get 36x squared, right? We actually wind up multiplying the, the variable as well. And so we do the same thing with our units too. So our units on this case would, or in this case, would wind up being feet times feet times feet. So it would be feet cubed would be our units here. And if we want to know where to round this, see here we've got three sig figs, two sig figs, and four sig figs. Well, our least precise number is that two sig fig measurement which means our answer can only have two sig figs. So when we round this, it would really be 7700 feet cubed. And that's really going to be plus or minus 100 cubic feet. Right, because we're only going to be keep, we could be off by an entire 100 cubic feet. That's our last sig fig that's going to get reported. So really a more a better way to write this rather than writing this the uncertainty out by hand would just be to say 7.7 .7 times 10 to the third. Oops. Feet cubed.
All right, so this is this is even easier in a lot of ways. As long as you know how to count your sig figs, this is even easier than doing keeping your same uncertainty. You just have to round and make sure that your answer is not an ambiguous number when it's written. So put it in scientific notation if you wind up with an ambiguous number. So 54 centimeters times 102.4 centimeters. We have two sig figs and four sig figs. So our answers can our answer can only have two sig figs as well. So the calculator answer would wind up being 5529.6 centimeters squared, rounded to two sig figs, sig figs. That'd be 5.5 times 10 to the third centimeters squared. All right, so questions about how multiplication and division works. Shouldn't that be 7710? Um, Dakota, you are correct if we were rounding to three sig figs. If we were rounding this number to three sig figs, it would wind up being 7,710. But because we're rounding only two sig figs, everything left to the right of that second seven gets dropped. We're, we're looking just at the tens place to determine where the hundreds place needs to be rounded up or not. Um, if we have division happening, the rule is the same. The way the units behave is a little bit different, but we're still just gonna be keeping the same number of digits, the same number of sig figs as our least precise number. So for this example here, we have four sig figs and three sig figs. So our answer can only have three significant figures. So we would wind up, and I can even do that one in my head, right? Divide by 10, shift the decimal place one spot. So 10.21 would be the calculator answer. And then our units, if we can't cancel them out, if we had something like x divided by y, um, we can't cancel out x's and y's, right? So for if we have meters and seconds that don't cancel out or anything like that, our units are just going to be meters over seconds, meters per second. Um, Stephanie, it's 2 times 10 to the third in the second question here because um, remember that that three is not telling us is not telling us how many sig figs we have. That three is telling us how many spots we had to move the decimal point. And that was three spots, one, two, three. So anything that's in the thousands is gonna be times 10 to the third. If it's in the 10 thousands, it would be times 10 to the fourth. Um, going back to this, this last one, we can only have three sig figs, though, um, because our 10.0 seconds only has three sig figs, so we need to round it, so it would just be 10.2 meters per second. And here we wind up with a weird case. Um, where now I'll answer that answer that in a second, Gina. Um, where we wind up with pounds divided by pounds, which if we were in math, if we had x divided by x, we'd wind up with the x's canceling out, right? So in this case, we wind up actually with the the units we're going to wind up canceling each other out. We'll get a number one seventy five over one ninety two point four. Our number would wind up being 0 0.90956 and so on, but we're only going to keep three significant figures. So we would round it to 0 0.910. And your units in this case, the pounds cancel out with 
compounds. And so we wind up sometimes in chemistry, we wind up with um, a, a ratio where we don't have any units on it. Um, but usually there's got to be some other context. Um, so for instance, this would be like a percent by mass. If we had pounds of, say, pounds of, um, pounds of water divided by pounds total in a, I don't know, a, a, a sample of uh, lake water. If we had 175 pounds of water and the total sample was 192.4 pounds, this number that this ratio we get up out is has no units to it, but it, we could say it's the, the fraction of water by mass. Or if we multiply it by 100 and got it as a percentage, we could say it's the percent water by mass. That by mass piece kind of is our unit. It's telling us what that number is, even though there's no units directly attached to the numbers anymore. And we'll get more practice with that. Percentages are, and ratios are weird that way. They don't technically have any units of their own because the units should cancel out. Um, so on a test or something like that, if you are trying to figure out what to do with the units here, if I don't give you any context for pounds of what, you could just leave it like this with no units on it. This is the one time I'm telling you, know, the one case where it's okay to not have a unit is if it's a ratio and your units wound up canceling each other out. All right, so here's where it gets a little tricky. Um, if we have a math problem where we have both addition and subtraction and multiplication and division, we have to do our, we have to follow order of operate operations. And then we have to do any rounding necessary before we switch from multiplication to addition and subtraction. So that means we have to remember how both of these rules work. And you have to do, for, if you're just doing multiplication and division, it doesn't matter if you multi if you do your rounding at the very end or if you round every step of the way, you should get approximately the same number. If you're just doing a bunch of addition and subtraction, it doesn't really matter if you round every step or if you wait to the end to round. But when you're mixing your operations up, you have to round when you switch between operations. All right, so we just have to be careful about doing our math all in one. We try not to do your math all in one step if you've got um if you're switching back and forth so to come up with a a physical example it's not chemistry based because we have you guys don't have the chemistry yet to answer um the kind of questions where this will come up um this sort of an arbitrary contrived situation where there's somebody's running a race and you've got a stopwatch if the race starts 152 meters from you and it ends 7.4 meters away from you and the runner takes 25.7 seconds, what is the speed of the runner? What is this? And so if we want to know the speed of the runner, we need to know the distance that they traveled and we need to know that the time they did it in, right? If you wanted to figure out your average speed on a road trip, say you're going, you go 1500 miles in, uh, I don't know, 36 hours, you would take your total distance, divide by your total time, right? So that's all we're going to do in this case. But to get your total distance traveled, we have to do a subtraction problem, right? If they're starting 152 meters away and then they're ending the race 7.4 meters away, we have a subtraction, and then we're dividing by the total time. Well, and when we're doing a fraction like this, distance divided by time, we need to, to do that subtraction first. It's in parentheses, right? So first thing we do is figure out this, the distance, do that subtraction, round it to the right spot, and then we can do our division. So if we did the subtraction, we'd wind up with 144.6 meters is the length of the race. 
but we have we are plus or minus one in the ones column here, right? So that means we need to round this to the ones place. Right, so our our answer as far as the distance traveled is going to wind up being 145 meters. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now that we've done our rounding properly from the subtraction, now we can do our division and we're switching to using the sig fig rules. Right, so now we've got three sig figs and four sig figs. And when, when we do this math, get 145 over 25.17, get something like, there's our calculator answer. We're going to round it to three sig figs. So we get 5.76 meters per second. We can't just use this, the division multiplication division rule or just use addition subtraction rule because that would give us the wrong number here. Um, if we just used the addition subtraction rule, we would keep our uncertainty to the ones place, right? Which would give us a final answer that only had one sig fig, right? But if we, and if we just used count the number of sig figs, we only get two sig figs because 7.4 is only two sig figs. So again, we wouldn't get the right number of sig figs on our final answer. So this is why it winds up being important to round as you go um, and switching the rules when you need to. I mean, that's, that's gonna be the single hardest thing to do to get right when it comes to the sig figs is, is doing these multi-step problems and knowing to, when to switch rules, all right? It's not gonna be, it's not the trickiest concept, it's the trickiest to do in, in practice. It's kind of boring as a concept, and you know we're spending so much time on it, but that's because it's hard to wrap your head around sometimes, oh, and to actually put into practice. So let's come up. Let's talk about another theoretical case. We'll give you a practice, and then we'll take our break and come back and work through the the uh, practice problem. So we have a room that's 16.0 feet by 32.5 feet. And these are roughly the dimensions of the classroom that we usually teach this in at the college. Um, so it's about a classroom size, picture a classroom size. If we wanted to find the area of the room, we would just do length times width, right? And we could figure out what the uncertainty is and round to the proper place. And we'll go through these answers in a second. And let's say that after the fact, maintenance has to come in and they have to install a bulkhead for a furnace or something in one corner of the room. And that bulkhead is 6.00 feet by 1.55 feet. How many square feet are lost? Ah, the animation thing is not working. And what is the new area of the room? Sorry, I'm jumping around here. Um, it keeps automatically jumping to the next slide when I want it to not. Um, I can fix that real quick though. There we go. All right, so here's your question. I'll give you five minutes to work on this. Um, and we'll take a 10 minute break. So in 15 minutes at 2.30, we'll come back and I'll work, work through this. Each of the pieces is gonna be addition, subtraction, or is gonna be multiplication, but then there's a subtraction part that happens at the end. So try and make sure you get the right rules for the right part. And we'll come back and work through it in 15 minutes. Thanks. And you record all of the class 
right, Sean? Because I'm in and out of service at the moment. Yeah, they're they're all recorded. Uh, it'll take about an hour, hour and a half after class is over for, for it to get posted and rendered on YouTube. Um, but then you but then the link will be up um, before before the end of business today, let's say. Um, and you should be able to get to it when you need to and you can catch up on the stuff you missed. Right on. Thanks. Drive in. Sean, am I confused here too? This room, it says it's 32.5 feet by 15 and then it's 16 by 30. Am I? No, that's that's just a typo. I, I changed the number okay, um, so at one point and didn't change the, so let, okay. me, let me fix that. All right, thank you. No problem.
All right. So we'll go start working through this here in a second. Um, I just wanted to come bring back the uh, the tutoring, getting a cranium cafe. If you do get logged in, which I think I just was not waiting long enough, whatever the service is that they're using to do the logging in is just slow today. Um, I just hit log in using my passport ID and everything and just waited over the break and it, it get loaded eventually. Uh, and you get this website. Um, and if you scroll down, so this is actually a lot of different good resources for you guys. Any Anybody that you need help with, um, with transferring, if you need to talk to a counselor, if you need to get registered, if you're having trouble registering, um, all the people that will can help you with all of that stuff are on here. Amanda Sanderson in particular is the one who usually handles late, late registration or dropping, withdrawing, stuff like that. Most of those emails will go to Amanda. So you can always just live chat her um, if she's on here. Um, and if you keep going down, they have all, they have the Disability Resource Center right here. Kelly Grenier is the one who's in charge of uh, academic accommodations. So if you need extra time on tests, um, you know, it's not as relevant now since you guys are all in your own houses taking tests. But if you, when we come back, if you, um, um, you know, need to be able to wear earplugs or listen to music while you take tests or things like that, um, any, any academic accommodations that you need, um, Kelly Grenier can help you get get that all sorted as well. Um, but the what we're looking at for uh, here's the financial aid office as well. Um, so any financial aid questions, um, but keep going, keep going, press all of this. You'll get to the library section, and the li this is where all the tutors are. Um, so they're all kind of listed together. Kevin Merle, it's the First tutor, I guess, um, and Nancy Nan um, is a writing tutor. But then the, all of the um, bio, stats, math, ASL, um, all of these different resources are available as tutors online. It's basically it's a similar setup to using a Zoom meeting. Um, you you just click on knock on door, and then they can hit invite. And then that opens up a video chat and it works just like Zoom from there. Um, and all the way down here is Erina, Erina McCarthy. Um, so it looks like for right now, she is working four to six on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So not our normal meeting times, which is perfect for you guys, those of you who can't make it to office hours or ask questions during lab should still be able to um, connect with Erina and she can help you answer questions. Um, so it's a little bit of a trek to get there. It's all the way down at the bottom, but um, there are some good resources there. All right, so let's go to this to our question, our questions for, um, that we're working on here. Um, so uh, Alyssa or Alisa? Um, Alyssa. Alyssa. Um, so Alyssa, you, that's a good question. It, the, the answer is not always the same because it depends on what the steps are. Um, so I'm going to switch. I'm going to stop the screen share and zoom in on my whiteboard here and we'll go through the steps. All right. So if we have our our room here finding the two different areas is pretty straightforward right we either have um, to find area one and i um, also want to point out that using these these are called subscripts these subscripts are just a way to, to um, differentiate between two different variables that are the same so we want to know that blue area and the red area. So I'm calling those area one and area two. So that's all the subscripts mean. They're not anything mathematical that are, it's tricky. Um, if I, to find area one, when I do my multiplication, if it's 16 feet times 32 and a half feet, you get 520 feet. And we have three sig figs in each of these two numbers, which means our final answer has to have three sig figs. Then we do the same thing for area two. 
we have 6.00 feet times 1.55 feet, which means our answer has to have three sig figs as well. So we get 9.30 square feet. So all of that's easy enough. Now, if we want to know what the new area is after we subtract away that, now we're switching rules. Now we're not going to keeping the same number of sig figs, we're keeping the same uncertainty. So when we do A1 minus A2, we're going to get so 520 feet squared minus 9.30 feet squared. Our 520 number is plus or minus one foot. And our 9.30 is plus or minus a hundredth of a foot. It's cute, uh, foot squared. Which means our answer could also be off by an entire square foot. So when we do the subtraction, when you plug this into the calculator, you get the 510.7 is the calculator answer. But we need to indicate that the uncertainty is in the ones place. So now it's not about counting sig figs. Now it's about going to the same number of decimal places because we switched from multiplication to subtraction. So your final answer for this one winds up being 511 square feet. All right, so the, the trickiest thing about this is that this is really easy to plug it all into your calculator and do it all at the same time. If you've got a TI-83, you use your parentheses, boom, you're good to go. The problem with that is, if you didn't actually stop to write down these two numbers, you don't know where you need to round. So when you're plugging stuff into your calculator for these, you got to be careful to stop when you're switching between operations and round at, at each of those steps. And, and again, this is, this is the exception. Usually, you'll be picking one of these rules and sticking with it. Most of the problems that we're going to deal with are either going to be all multiplication division or all addition subtraction. But there are a few cases where we're dealing with something like change in temperature. And then we take a change in temperature, and then we do a bunch of multiplication to it. Well, change is a subtraction problem, and then we're going to multiply. So we got to be paying attention to when we're switching over. And again, I'm not telling you that that you can't get to the point where you're good at this, but I'm going to mark you guys down on this a lot. Um, it's just one of the things that I, did, I didn't get good at it till the first time I had to teach it, frankly. The only reason I got that good at it is because I wanted to make sure if anybody asked me tricky questions in class that I could answer them. If you're like me, when I was a student, I just got to the point where I would usually get the right answer. And then I didn't worry about the weird cases. Um, I'm not telling you to do it that way, but that's you know, not, a, not a bad way to think about it. Get the basics down. Don't worry about the really tricky part. Do your best on the really tricky part if you can make it make sense. Yeah, Dana. So one more time on the subtraction. So Remember, our rule with addition and subtraction is we want to keep the same uncertainty. Because if you could be, if we're talking about time, if your ETA is going to be plus or minus an hour, then an extra 15 seconds here or there is not going to make a difference, right? Your uncertainty at the very end is going to be still plus or minus an hour. So here we've got a big number that's plus or minus one. Then we're subtracting a smaller number that's plus or minus 0 0.01. So that means if we could be off by an entire square foot on our 520 number, then that means our answer could be off by an entire foot. So that tells us we have to round to the ones place when we're doing this problem. Right, so 
Multiplication and division, keep the same number of sig figs as your, as your smallest number of sig figs. Addition, subtraction, you keep the same uncertainty, which means you go to the same number of digits as your least precise number. And we'll keep practicing that and going over it as well um, as we're doing more problems too. So if that's still tricky for you, don't worry about it. We can go over practice problems and office hours and then lab and stuff this week too. Isabella? Do you mind if I ask a question really quick? No, please. Um, for language sake, you said that for the uncertainty, you want to make sure it's in that. Um, this is, oh gosh, okay. I'm trying to make sure I have the right question here that I want to ask. Is, is it better to say it's like the greater value spot versus like, you know, you have 0 0.01 and then you have a one spot. So in terms of like, you know, we use the least sig fig, can you say it's like the greater value? Does that, do you know what I'm trying to say here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and fra phrasing it does get tricky. So you can say it as you want to keep this the greater uncertainty, or yeah. you want to keep the same uncertainty as your least accurate number. Yeah. There are a lot of different ways to phrase okay. it. Okay. I just want to make sure right it's track. like synonymous the way that I understand it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. No problem. All right. Let me go back to screen share here. Any other questions on this first? Okay, so this is actually somewhat of a relevant, like this is not a super contrived example, right? Because if you're adding a smaller chunk, it's, you're, more, you're probably gonna have it measured more accurately, right? So it makes sense why you would have more sig figs or why the uncertainty would be smaller on this small thing we're adding. Um, and it does wind up making a difference if we're in terms of knowing what the uncertainty is on our final answer. All right, so let's talk about something that's less, I don't want to say boring, but less pedantic, um, less nitpicky. Um, and so this is going to be a tool that we're going to use. Basically, this is going to be the number one tool that you guys use in this class when it comes to the math is going to be conversions. Almost any math, any word problem that I can write for you guys, um, short of calculus, can be solved as a conversion. So we're going to, at least in the in chemistry, it is. Um, we're going to spend a fair bit of time on this and practice writing conversions and using unit conversions as a way of solving word problems. Um, so let's start with the basics, though. So we're going to define some things and do some practice conversions that you know how to do in your head. You know how to convert from feet to inches if you've grown up in the United States, right? You multiply by 12. But why does that work? And how do we do, if we have a more complicated conversion, how do we know how to do it? And so the way we do that is we start by writing equalities. And so an equality is anytime we can say two things are equal, really broad, right? Anytime you can say two things are equal, we can write as, a, as an equality, meaning we can say one meter equals 100 centimeters. That's an equality, right? And it can be things that aren't as obvious. Like you could say, um, you could write an equality that says one inning equals three outs. If you're a baseball fan, that's an equality. It's not something we're used to thinking about in terms of math, but we can still say those two things are equal to each other. And so there's a lot of other equalities we can write for length. Um, we can write one for miles. We can write um, all sorts of equalities for length. We can so, and we talked about a lot of them. We just didn't sit, write them as an equality, right? We said one fathom is six feet. Um, you know, one league is X number of feet. So things like that. One mile is five thousand two hundred eighty feet. Those are all equalities. Anytime you can say two things are equal to each other. And we can write equalities for anything. You know, you can write four quarts equals one gallon. That's an equality. Or three, two tablespoons equals one fluid ounce is an equality. 
anything, any kitchen conversions that you would do if you're baking or cooking, those are all equalities too, right? The trick is that we can rearrange any equalities into conversion factors, right? And what a conversion factor is, is it's basically anything we can say is equal to one. If we start with an equality, like one meter equals 100 centimeters, well, if we divide both sides by one meter, then on the left-hand side, we just wind up with meters canceling out with meters, right? We just get one. So we would get one equals 100 centimeters over one meter, which, okay, weird flex, but sure, you can do that. Doesn't really look all that obvious why that's helpful, right? Except no matter what number we start with, we can always multiply by one without changing it, right? That's the first thing you learn in multiplication back in fourth grade or third grade or whatever it is is if you multiply by one, you don't change anything. Well, you can, that means you can multiply by anything that's equal to one without changing anything too, right? So if we have, if all of our conversion factors are equal to one, we can multiply by a conversion factor and nothing changes the original number. The only thing that's gonna change is the units. So if we had meters and we wanted to go to centimeters, you may know how to do this one intuitively. If there's a hundred centimeters in a meter, you could probably in your head figure out, okay, this is how I need to do it. I need to multiply by a hundred. The reason that that works is because you're multiplying by a conversion factor. If you've got centimeters on top and meters on bottom, then when, remember our rules for multiplying fractions are you just multiply from left to right across, right? You multiply all the way across the top and you multiply all the way across the bottom and you cancel anything out that's the same on top and bottom. So 5.71 meters times this conversion factor, you're gonna get meters over meters, which cancels out. And that means that the only units that are gonna be left are gonna be centimeters. Right? And so this is how, this is the same reason that you multiply by 12 to go from feet to inches. This is how you show your work in a way that makes sure that you don't multiply by 100 when you're supposed to divide by 100. You make the units cancel out. All right, and so you just, when you write this out, you would just cross out meters on top, meters on bottom. You don't cross out the number on bottom, just the units. So if we wanted to go 5.33 feet to inches, again, you guys know how to do this. Write it out the right way, though. Show your work. Make feet cancel out with feet. Yeah, that's all we're doing. This is the... the Technical name for this is dim dimensional analysis, um, better known as unit conversions. All right, so write this out and then we'll make sure you show your, your units canceling out. So our, our equality we want to go 5.33. I gotta stop writing all the way at the top so that the uh, glare doesn't get in the way. That's not so bad though. feet and if we know 12 inches equals one foot we can write that as an as a conversion that's going to allow feet to cancel out with feet so if we have feet on the top of our fraction here because remember 
whatever unit we're starting with, if we wanted to write it as a fraction, it would just be over one, right? So we've got feet on the top, which means we're going to want to multiply it by a conversion where feet is on the bottom. So one foot equals 12 inches. So just like you, you predicted, just like you knew how to do intuitively, we're going to wind up multiplying by 12. And we're going to get, what, 64? 64.0, I think, is what we're going to come up with. Maybe 63.9. Right. And because we set it up so that feet is on top and feet is on bottom, they cancel out and they're gone. And we get the same number we started with just in different units because all we did was multiply by one. So this would be the, as for this class, this would be how I would show the work for this. If I say convert 5.33 feet to inches, just write it out just like this. Right? So you're showing your equality, your, your conversion. And anything, you can write any equality as a conversion factor. A conversion factor is anything where the top is equal to the bottom. Any fraction where you can say the top is equal to the bottom. Oh, so if the calculator answer is 63.96, this has three sig figs, right? And we haven't talked about exact numbers yet, but this is where we're going next. Is It's not about 12 inches in a foot, right? It's not 12 inches plus or minus an inch. It's That's what a foot is. It's a definition. So this is what's a... A lot of conversions are, are what are called exact numbers, meaning basically that this is infinite sig figs. That 12, it's not really 12 plus or minus one, it's 12.000 out to infinity, right? So three sig figs here, infinite sig figs there, our answer has got to have three sig figs. All right, so what if we wanted to go, the reason why it's worth writing these out when we already know what the steps are, when you intuitively know I'm just supposed to multiply by 12, the reason you still wanna write it out and show your work is because we're gonna get into longer conversions now where it's more than one step. But the process is the exact same. You make your unit on top, cancel out with what's on bottom. So if I asked you, to go from inches to miles, that's a little bit trickier. That's You might not know how to do that in your head. You might not intuitively know what to punch in your calculator, right? But if you can go from inches to feet, because you know that conversion, and then you can go from feet to miles, we have to write it as two steps, but it's the same thing happening in both cases. And so the, what I recommend doing for these longer conversions is to have what I call a roadmap. So before you plug in any numbers, you basically just get, get the logic out. You write it so you can say, okay, well, I know I can convert from inches to feet. And once I'm in feet, I know I can go from feet to miles. So I, I like to write it out as, Five point three three times ten to the six inches. I know I can go from inches to feet and feet to miles. All right, so that's my roadmap. Is just what are the conversions I'm going to need to do? And your roadmaps can be fairly long for some of the problems we're going to do. And as you get better and better at this, you might not need to write every step in your roadmap. 
once you get good at converting from inches to miles, you don't need to write out feet in the middle necessarily. We'd still write in, make the units cancel out. Um, but for now, just show every conversion. So if we can say, I know 12 inches equals one foot. And if you have a conversion sheet or if you have a list of conversions that are common, or if you've done this before, you may, or you might know how many feet are in a mile, we're also going to use 5,280 feet is the definition of one mile. And anytime you say is the definition of, anytime you, you're, you've got a con, inequality within the same unit, like going from British unit to British unit, that's going to be an exact number, meaning infinite sig figs, because it's not about four quarts in a gallon. It's exactly, that's what a gallon is, is four quarts. Right, so anytime you've got conversions within the same system, so metric to metric or imperial to imperial, it's gonna, they're gonna be exact. So if we wanna write out our conversion here and do the math, Five point three three times ten to the sixth inches is where we're starting, and for every twelve inches is one foot. Now we're going to set up the next one so that feet is on the bottom. So we can either pause. You could either hit enter on your calculator, write out your number in feet, and then convert feet to miles. Or we can multiply by one again without changing anything, right? We just want, we want inches to cancel inches, and now we want feet to cancel feet. So you put 5,280 feet is one mile. And now we get feet canceling feet. The only units that are left now, when we're done with all this, are going to be miles. Right? We multiplied by one, and then we multiplied by one again. So our final answer winds up being what? Ends up being eighty-four point one. 84.1. 84.1 miles. So right number of sig figs, does that match everybody else's calculator work? It's a reasonable number, 5 million inches. This is about, about 84 miles. That seems ballpark, right? It doesn't sound like an absurd number. If we did something wrong, if we multiplied by 5,000 when we were supposed to end, when we were supposed to divide by 5,000, we'd get a number that doesn't make sense. We'd get 5 million inches equals a billion miles. We know that can't be right, right? So do your reasonableness check. And then when it comes to sig figs, our starting number is three sig figs. This one's exact. This number is exact. Right, so a lot of the conversions are going to be exact. And so that means you're going to end with the same number of sig figs that you started with. All right, let's... look at a couple more of these. Um, so before we jump ahead, let me pull up the equation sheet that, for this class so you guys know. Um, when I write these problems, the equation sheet that's on the resources section is the equation sheet that I'm using with sitting in front of me that I'm assuming you're using. There are lots of other equation sheets out there that have more conversions. Um, but th this is the one, the one from the Canvas shell is the version that I'm assuming that you guys have access to. Right, so go down to resources, go to the official equation sheet.
right? And so you've got equations on here, but if you scroll down, there's a whole list of conversions. There's length conversions, and it, it tells you on the sheet here, all conversions within the same system are exact, and all conversions between systems are approximate unless otherwise noted. So there, there are is basically one exact conversion between metric and um, imperial units, and that's centimeters to inches. So after after the 80s, when when um, the rest of the world couldn't get America to actually switch over to using centimeters, um, the the compromise was well, fine. Then you just have to redefine an inch so that we can have an exact conversion. So actually, sometime in the late 80s, there was a switch over where um, an inch actually changed very slightly. Um, and the definition of an inch now is 2.54 centimeters. Before, an inch was like 2.54002 or something like that. So it didn't change by very much. But what that gives us is now we have at least one conversion that goes from metric to British units. Um, that is exact. And then there's this other weird unit here that we use when we're talking about the size of individual atoms called an angstrom. Um, we'll get into that later on. It's basically, it's about 10 times smaller than a nanometer. And most atoms, the, the radius of most atoms is in that scale. Most atoms are about an angstrom across in diameter. Um, but so anytime we want to do more conversions, or if you don't know what conversions to start from, look here. There's You've got your volume conversions. You've got time conversions. Um, pressure and energy, we haven't defined what those are yet, but we'll get there. Um, so these are the units that I'm always going to go back to. These are, this is a, if you know how to use it, this is a fairly comprehensive conversion sheet. Um, it doesn't have anything directly necessarily to say go from liters to gallons, but you can go from liters to quarts and then from quarts to gallons. So there's you might have to do multiple steps, but this has everything you need for this class on it. And if you come across anything that you think should be on here and isn't, let me know and I'll add it. Or I'll tell you, no, you don't need that. Um, at this point, I think that one's more likely is I think I've found all of the glaring flaws on this one and fixed them. And let me catch up on the... Yes, all right, so just to, to show the exact way we could enter this um, into the calculator, I'm just gonna pull up Wolfram Alpha because it does both. I can type things in and then it'll rewrite it. So um, here's a good shorthand as well. If you wanna do scientific notation on um, Google or Wolfram Alpha or most calculators, there's an option that looks like an uppercase E. Um, and an uppercase E is shorthand for times 10 to the. So if I wanted to type in 5.33 times 10 to the six, I could type in 5.33 capital E six. And that's, that's the same thing as writing it out in scientific notation, or you can even just type it. 5.33 times 10 to the six. Uh, and then we're taking that, and for our equation we wrote here, we're going to divide that by 12, or we can think of it as times 1 over 12 times 1, parentheses, 1 over 5,280. So when we typed that in, you get 5.33 times 10 to the 6 divided by times 1 over 12 times 1 over 5,280 gives you 84.12247 repeating, right? And we're only going to keep three sig figs, so we're rounding after the tenths place, so you get 84.1. And if you want to try using that E, 
it'll write it the same way when it interprets it here. It just saves you some, some writing if you use that scientific notation shorthand. Or on uh, a TI-83, this is an old school one, but if you look right, see if I can get it focused in, right there is on the yellow, it's E, E, capital E, capital E. That's um, most Texas Instruments calculators will have that shortcut somewhere that'll allow you to type in scientific notation more quickly once you get the hang of it. All right, so some tips for these though. We can do multiple steps at the same time. And the other thing that, that might be easier is instead of doing multiple steps at the same time, you don't have to write them all together like this. You can go from inches to feet and then from feet to miles. And so if typing that in would look like if we just didn't write the second um, conversion in there, we'd go from 5.33 times 10 to the six for dividing by 12. So we'd get 4.44 times 10 to the five. And that's in feet. And then you can go, okay, and then I'm gonna take that 4.44 times 10 to the five. And that's gonna be times one over 5,280. We get a slightly different number in the calculator when we do that but it's the same with insignificant figures though, right? Because we're still gonna round to the tenths place. So it might go from 84 point, instead of being 84.122, if you stop in the middle and round, now you get 84.09, but that's still gonna round to 84.1, right? And even if it was off by one digit in the last sig fig, that's why we have uncertainty in the last sig fig. So it's no big deal. You can. Break it up however you want. You can round every step. You can wait till the very end to do your rounding, as long as it's all multiplication and division. As long as you're not switching you know, from addition, subtraction to multiplication, division, then you can wait and do all your rounding at the end if you want. Other tips on here is whatever your starting unit is, if you don't know where to go, if you don't know what your roadmap is going to be, the very first thing you do has to cancel out inches, though. So you're going to have to start with a conversion that involves inches. Inches to what? That depends on where you're trying to go. But you're always going to start by canceling out your starting unit. And then this is the second one is that roadmap. Set yourself up a strategy. I know I can go from inches to feet. And then I know I have a conversion for feet to miles or whatever, whichever direction you're trying to go. All right, so let's, last thing I wanna to cover today is using these metric prefixes. All right, so I mentioned this the other day that we generally try to keep our numbers for, um, for measured units in, in a certain ballpark. Usually we don't like to use numbers larger than a thousand or numbers smaller than about a hundredth. Um, anything larger or smaller than that, really what we wanna do normally is switch it to a different unit. Just because our brains don't process big numbers or small numbers very well. And so the way we can do that in a very predictable way um, is that we wind up using prefixes to modify units that already exist. So we usually think of, of them as being metric prefixes, but they actually apply to anything. You can have nano inches and you can have, you know, you can have kilo pounds. All a prefix is, is a multiplier. Uh, and so if you want to know a good example of why we might want to do this, the there we go. Um, if you go to this link here, um, this is a uh, little Java applet called the Scale of the Universe. 
um, that's just really fun to play around with. Has you know nice, um, awe awe inspiring music. Um, but basically, this is a way for you to sort of get an idea for just how big and how small certain things are. So if you start from the size of a human, a dodo is about three inches, about or three feet, about one meter. Um, the world's largest flower is called Rafflesia. It's about three feet across. It smells like rotting meat um, to attract flies. Um, and if you don't want to ever sleep again, you can start looking at things like giant earthworms. Giant earthworms are roughly 10 feet long. Um, and even worse is Japanese spider crab that from end to end, from toe to toe, a Japanese spider crab can be 10 feet long and it looks a lot like a spider. Um, but you can see if we start zooming in or out, if we start getting smaller, every time we hit one of these circles, we're switching to a different unit. So we went from one meter and now we're zoomed into a point where this circle is one millimeter across. And if we we can keep going smaller and smaller and we start getting things like chloroplasts. A chloroplast is about a, a thousandth of an inch. No, that's not right. A thousandth of a centimeter. Um, and you can keep getting smaller and smaller. But if we want to talk about things to the size of a virus, we don't want to talk about them in size meters, right? Because we're dealing now we're dealing with something that's so small that meters doesn't make any sense to use that. And you can keep going. And it goes smaller and smaller and smaller. And you notice that we still got a long ways to go on this slider. We're talking about the size of individual protons and neutrons now. When you get a disclaimer here, lengths shorter than this are not confirmed. AKA we can't measure anything smaller than this because we usually measure things by bouncing light off of them. And if you get to something that's smaller than the wavelength of light that you're using, then you can't actually be sure where it is. Um, but in theory, you start getting to things of like, go all the way down. You get to what's called the Planck, the Planck length named after Max Planck. Um, it's a unit of length, which in, Theory, I don't know if this has been conclusively proven or not. You have to talk to the theoretical physicists. Um, you can't have anything smaller than this. Again, in theory, it's not been proven, but this is kind of like the pixelation of the universe. Yet, you literally cannot have objects smaller than that. And if you go to the opposite end, we zoom way back out. We start getting into galaxies and then all the way out there we get the observable universe um aka the observable universe is actually how we know how old the universe is because light's the fastest thing in the universe right and so nothing can travel faster than light and the the furthest objects we can observe from earth are about 93 93 billion, no, sorry, when, yeah, 93 billion light years away, which tells us the universe is about 93 billion years old. Because if it was older than that, then light would have had longer to travel and we'd be seeing things that were further away. Um, so all of this to say, oh, and here's the Hubble deep field, the distance to that, those uh, galaxies that were in the Hubble deep field that I showed in the first day of class, is about 12 billion light years away. Um, so if you were a photon, or you could jump on a photon and travel at the speed of light, it would still take you 12 billion years to reach those galaxies in that figure. It's kind of cool. Um, all of this is just a roundabout tangent way of saying, sometimes we need really big units, and sometimes we re need really small units. Um, and so the way we do that is by using these prefixes, right? And so there are prefixes that makes things bigger and there are prefixes that make things smaller. But what it comes down to is, is it's always gonna be modifying an existing unit. So the metric system is designed 
really well to make use of these prefixes. And so instead of needing to know that there's 12 inches in our feet, you could just know that kilo means a thousand of something. Um, so these are the most common prefixes that make things smaller. If you put kilo in front of a unit, that means that you're talking that the new unit is a thousand times bigger than the one you started with. So a kilometer or kilometer, but really kilo and meter is a thousand times larger than a meter. A gigabyte is a, is a billion times larger than a byte. Right, so all of these prefix, that's all they do. And they can, you can put them on anything. You put them on seconds, you can put them on years, you can put them on grams. You can put them on pounds. You could have kilo pounds. It'd be a weird unit, but you could do it. Two kilo pounds would be a ton. Right, because one kilo pound is the same as a thousand pounds. And then we can do the flip side. So if we wanted to say, Tera, a tera second, one tera second is equal to, so we look at the multiplier here, 10 to the 12. So one tera second is 10 to the 12 seconds. Right? And so a gigameter is 10 to the nine meters. A kilogram is 10 to the three grams. And we could go the other way too. There are prefixes that make things smaller as well. And if you're in biology or chemistry, usually we're dealing with things that make thing, the uh, prefixes that make things smaller. Um, but we can write two different equalities for each of these. Um, you could write you could write one terasecond is equal to 10 to the 12 seconds, or you could also write one second is equal to 10 to the minus 12 teraseconds. Right? Because all of that's really doing is dividing both sides by 10 to the 12 to switch back and forth between these. Most people, myself included, would rather not deal with negative exponents when you can. So I typically like to write them in the form where you have 10 to a big number rather than 10 to a negative number. Um, but they will both give you the same answer mathematically. So you can say one kilometer is 1,000 meters. That, to me, makes more sense in my head than saying one meter is 0 0.001 kilometers. But they're both mathematically correct. And while we're running out of time, the prefixes that make things smaller, um, there are a lot, there are more of those that are commonly used. Um, deci, centi, milli, micro, nano, pico. Once you get to milli, these all go by powers of 10. So we're dealing with thousands, millionths, billionths, trillionths. Um, and the trick with these is to remember which way they work. Is this, is this a prefix that's going to make things smaller? Or is this a prefix that makes things bigger? Because that'll make sure that you write the right conversion factor. You could so that you because if you know that a centimeter is smaller than a meter, then all you need to know is this this right here that is at ten to the minus two, and then you can say okay, ten to the minus two, and I know a centimeter is smaller than a meter. Therefore, I can say ten to the two centimeters equals one meter. Right. These are the ones that people mess up all the time, though, especially on the test when you guys are in a time situation or trying to go fast. Um, you would be amazed how many times I have to mark people down for saying things like there's 100, 100 meters in one centimeter. Things that you guys know are not true, but you will write them down the wrong way because you're going fast and not doing your reasonableness checks. So just be careful. 
make sure it makes sense when you write it down and you'll be okay. Um, and the last thing I wanna leave you with, I know we're running out of time, um, is these are on the um, equation sheet as well. And again, I don't give you that much information, so it's all about knowing how they work. Um, but the other thing to pay attention to is capital letters versus lowercase letters matters when we're talking about units. Capital M is a prefix that means times 10 to the 6. It's mega something, so a megabyte, for instance, versus a lowercase m means milli, 10 to the minus 3. Right, so mixing up capital versus lowercase is really going to throw off your your numbers if you're not careful. Pita versus pico. I don't know why they didn't just pick some different um, some different letters. Um, that's not true. I do know why they didn't do that because they started running out of letters. You know, mathematicians and physicists like to use letters for everything. I'll include chemists in there too. Um, so you start running out of letters, you start having to be specific about which case of letters you're using. Um, and so just be be watching out for that. And just an example of that would be um, somebody suggested back in the chat a while ago about a conversion from liters to milliliters. And I was really confused as to what they were writing because I already had this in my head. And they capitalized the M in lowercase and did lowercase for the L. So the way that you would do it in English class. But liters is a capital L. So milliliters should be lowercase l cap or lowercase m capital L. If you write it the other way around, you're saying something else, right? So um, megaliters would be capital M capital L. I don't know what the unit is for lowercase l. It might be a unit of torque, or it might not exist as a unit. So. Um, also goes into being careful with your other units. Lowercase m as a unit is meters. Mi is miles. Min is minutes. So we got to just be, be paying attention to your units and your cases on those. And you will keep yourself from getting quite as confused um, because you will confuse yourselves on these homework problems by writing mi when you meant minutes and then you're trying to convert something that was in minutes and now you're trying to convert it into feet or something like that and just everything goes bonkers all right so i'll end there i'll stop the recording